Before we get started, I want to remind everyone to be sure to give the video a like. That's always helpful. And also be sure to share this video message on your social media. There's a lot of people out there who have yet to hear the black media. They have yet to hear this message, and I know that they will appreciate it as much as you have. Also, I would remind everyone that Tariq has started a foundational Black American Convention crowdfunding, and it is ongoing now. Link is in the description. That said, the Black Empowerment Agenda making sure that the former slaves of the United States who are in the belly of the beast, in the heart of the evil empire, are made whole and are empowered. This is the single biggest threat to white supremacy the world has ever known. But there's something about white supremacy you need to understand. White supremacy has effectively organized itself into the world order. There's not really a whole lot of people out there at all, especially not even black people who are trying to topple white supremacy. You just got a whole lot of folks trying to find a comfortable place under it. White supremacy has told everyone their place. And there's a lot of people who have decided that, well, as long as I'm not on the bottom, I will accept my place under white supremacy. That's what you see going on in Asia and South America and Africa. These people, these countries, these regions, these entire continents have decided to bend the knee to white supremacy. Nobody is really trying to topple white supremacy. The UN, the United Nothing, they're damn sure not trying to do it. The only substantive faction on this planet calling white supremacy out for what it is and working to destroy it happens to be the former slaves of the United States. That's it. Sorry, but that's just a fact for those of you out there who want to try to say that a couple of dudes in a bodega in Kingston, Jamaica, or a couple of people in London somewhere, that that somehow, somehow that is what qualifies as substantive effort against white supremacy. Sorry, but it doesn't. The same way that you cannot have an alliance with one person, unless that person is a hugely wealthy individual like Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates, you also are not able to have a political or socioeconomic alliance with only one person, no matter how well-meaning they may be. This is just a fact. Now, sometimes, as black people, since we haven't really had a deeply ingrained, aggressively promoted, and sustained culture of political discourse within our community. Keep in mind, it was only a little over a decade ago that I put the phrase out there that the purpose of the black media is to take control of the social discourse within the black community and to elevate the debate. Before we came along, people were shucking and jiving, and that crap from the breakfast schlubs, that was about as intelligent as black discourse became. You've all seen the video that Tariq posted on his Twitter where you had Angela Rye with lettuce and tomatoes on the side. And here she is calling herself doing some shucking and jiving with Elizabeth Warren. Asking her what college football team does she like? And what brand of fried chicken does she like? This is the same crap that they did with Hillary Clinton. What kind of hot sauce does she like? Now keep in mind, this is largely being done as them basically doing a gesture of defiance. Black people are in a life and death proposition. You got the white media's black bootlicks sitting there saying, hey, we're going to go down with our flag flying low. And that's the reason why it is that Angela Rye feels not a pang of remorse for doing this crap. She's a clown and she knows she's supposed to be a clown. And as far as she's concerned, she's going to keep it a three ring circus because she knows the white media put her out there specifically for that. She's not there to challenge Elizabeth Warren or any other white political candidate on anything of value or importance. Her job is to help to reinforce the position of white supremacy, not to undermine it. Yeah, it's pretty easy to tell who the white media's black bootlicks are. And when it comes to the issue of tangibles, well, there's been a lot of people who have been working against our interests for decades now. I've already told you about Big Bird. And for those of you who don't know, it's that clown with the dreadlocks, Reverend whatever who happens to, I call him Big Bird because when he was on Joy Reid, he looked like he was wearing his mother's tablecloth. This clown ain't produced a dang thing in decades. Talking about how he's part of the longest standing reparations organization. Yeah, who, that hasn't put any points on the freaking board, hasn't done anything, hasn't gotten us penny number one, hasn't even gotten any politicians to make any pledges, hasn't confronted anyone because he wasn't there to confront anyone. 
We have allowed white supremacy, white money, to set up all kinds of dummy front organizations and place them amongst us. And then they get us following it by putting some bootlick Negro out front who will sit there and say one or two things. And as black people, we are willing to settle for the bare minimum. We are willing to settle for the lowest common denominator. You don't have to actually give us any of that hardcore black empowerment talk. All you got to do is just say one or two words. Hell, you ain't got to go that far. Just uh, just go ahead and hint at it. If you just hint at it, our imaginations will fill in the blanks because we're so desperate for somebody who actually shows up and is real, who is actually about it. We're so desperate for it, but we're willing to settle for anything we can get, even if what we're getting is nothing. So that's the reason why we've been easy prey for every faker, fraud, phony, and fool who's come down the pike. But that's changing because there happen to be some voices out there, the new voices of black media in general, but I'm talking about the black media in specific, who have been providing the substantive pushback. You see, it's not enough to simply have an ideology. That ideology has to be promoted. What you have to have is a dedicated pundit class. And that is something we have not had. We have not had a dedicated pundit class. We've had some dedicated entertainers. We've had some dedicated class clowns. We've had some dedicated street fools. But we haven't had a real pundit class. A pundit class is there to help illuminate the political terrain for your benefit. They are not merely out there shucking and jiving. That's part of the reason why with me and Jason, you notice how we never tell jokes. We're not running around trying to make you laugh. Because our people are facing a genocide. And that's not funny. We are making it where we're shutting down all the ha ha and, and all of the freaking shucking and jiving and all of the kidding around. We're shutting that down. We're making it where the black discourse is becoming serious again. But you see where the white media's black dead enders, Angela Rye with lettuce and tomatoes on the side, you see that they're trying to figure out, well, well, we know that we can, there's still some black folks out there who will go for the nonsense. So we'll go ahead and put on a comedy routine and see how many of them fall for it. Only the dumb ones will. Roly poly, he's doing the same thing. This is the last stand of the black bootlicks. That's what we're seeing get, being put on here. Because as more and more black people are hearing the message of black empowerment, as more and more black people are understanding what elections are supposed to be about, and that is about what you're going to get, and now we're putting specifics out there. I was the one who first put out the word, who put out the, the figure, $16 trillion for reparations. Nobody was really saying a figure, and the few people who actually were kind of nibbling around the edges, they were saying like two or three trillion. I'm like, no, you know what the freaking number is supposed to be. It's 16 trillion. I'm talking about people who are who you would consider to be on the side of the new voices of black media. People were, were lowballing. And I'm like, no, we need to go ahead and say exactly what it is. Oh, that'll just make them say no. Look, I dealt in sales for many years. And one of the things that we were taught in sales was that the price is the price. And that if somebody's going to be buying a car or if some if you're negotiating with somebody over a house or 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 a timeshare or any kind of thing that involves some sort of monthly payment, any sort of high ticket item, when you tell the person the price, Typically, the response that's going to come from a lot of people is going to be, man, uh, that's a lot of money. And when somebody says that, you do not decide to lower the price just because the person says, yeah, that's, that's a lot of money. But you, tell, you can go ahead and agree with them and say, yes, it is. And you're getting a lot for that. But the point is, you don't decide we're going to anticipate rolling back the price. You do not do that. If the item is worth what you say it is, or in this case, if the greatest, if this is indeed the greatest crime in human history that this government is being made to be punished for, then you don't decide to roll back the price just because the thief, or rather nation of thieves, are sitting here going, the price is high, not as high as it was for our ancestors, not as high as it's been for us. There is no way that you can put a price tag on it. But we are going to make sure that you don't profit from it. That's what's going on here. 
So that's the reason why I boldly said 16 trillion. And what happened was I said, you know what? Let's just make it. Why why go it in the middle like that? Let's make it a nice round 20 trillion. Now, why would I do that? Because one of the things that I also learned when I was working in sales was that when it comes to dealing with people, the first time that you give them the price, it will shock them. Everybody's shocked by the price because everybody's a bunch of everybody's out here trying to lowball you on everything. So everybody's going to be no matter what the price is, it's always going to be too high. So that's typical. If they sit there and go, man, that, that is a pretty high price. So what? But the first time you say it to them, it will shock them. Second time you say it to them, it will surprise them. The third or fourth time you say it to them, it will have their attention. By the fifth or sixth time, they will have made their peace with it. But what you do not do is decide that you're going to be caving in. And I'm glad to see that by sticking to my guns, more people out there, they've been encouraged. All of that two and three trillion dollar talk went away. And now people are starting to use real numbers. And the thing about it is, yes, you got people out there objecting to it. They can object all they want. They object to anything. If black people demand something for free, as long as it's something that advantages us, it's always something worthy of objection. They object to anything that they think might advantage us. The end of bringing Africans to the United States to be enslaved, they objected to that. The abolition of slavery, they objected to that. The end of Jim Crow, or at least Jim Crow 1.0, they objected to that. The end of segregation, on paper, they objected to that. The end of lynchings, they objected to that. The March on Washington, they objected to that. Black men being able to exercise their Second Amendment rights, they objected to that. And in California, of all places, supposed to be the most liberal place in the country. Now, where black folks are concerned... So anything that advantages black people or is seen at the very least as easing the grip of the vice around our collective throats, anything that seems to let up on the oppression in any way against us is immediately objected to. And if you start talking about something that's going to advantage black people, as far as they're concerned, that's the end of the world. So the fact that they're objecting means nothing to me. They object to anything regarding us simply as a reflex. They don't even hear it out. It's, you haven't even said anything. Well, black people need objection. Well, black people should have objection. They haven't even heard it. That They have this impulse because of the fact that we let them get away with it for so long. So, of course, when they start complaining about the price tag or the greatest crime in human history, that's not going to move me. And I don't expect it to move you either. I'm not going to let you go weak on this. Or I'm not going to let you get all wobbly on this one. No, my friends, we are at war with white supremacy. And in this army, in the B-1 Brigade, we hold the line. We understand the opposition to black empowerment from without. That's obvious. But we also need to address the opposition to black empowerment from within. Bootlicks, clowns looking to get on the payroll, they're easy enough to call out. Their motivations are obvious. The big birds and the roly polies and the Issa Rays, these P and the Angela Rise with lettuce and tomatoes on the side, these clowns wear their treason like a badge of honor. But they're not the only enemy within. You see, black empowerment comes with rules, regulations, and responsibilities. Black people don't like that, especially when you have these rules, regulations, and responsibilities being spelled out by other black people. As I've taught you before, there are typically two types of benefits that white supremacy offers. They offer tangible benefits, but they also offer psychic benefits. But what white supremacy found over time that just like the Pavlovian dog, if you offer psychic benefits enough times, and you have tangibles attached to those psychic benefits enough time, sooner or later, you'll be able to stop offering the tangible benefits and just offer the pat on the head. If you start off with a pat on the head and a good, you a good little boy, and you give somebody a couple of pennies, or you give them some old moldy, crusty bread, that'll be fine. But eventually you can get away if you, if the person is weak willed and just codependent enough. And God knows with black folks, we have no shortage of that. What will happen over time is you'll find that you'll be able to get away with just showing up and a pat on the head will be enough. Why? You'll be able to have black folks who will eagerly decide to attack one another just to get a pat on the head from the white powers that be, especially the white media. Some black folks seem to think that this white media likes them. Richard Spencer got tons of ink from the white media. 
and look what they were able to do to him. See, the alt-right, the reason that these guys wound up pulling out the knives on each other was ultimately it became a matter of trying to get attention. Jockeying for position. I posted on my Twitter page that in Charlottesville, you had something like 30 different white supremacist groups. You saw a couple dozen different flags, everything from the swastika to the Confederate flag to stuff that just looks like it came out of a freaking zoo, because it did. And you had God knows how many symbols that these guys had. But they were all on the same page when it came to their agenda. No matter what names they chose for themselves, and no matter what sort of personal differences that they claim to have, when it came time to have that mass expression of unified white supremacist fervor that these guys were declaring to the entire world that you're not going to replace us. Well, what do you mean replacing? Nobody's replacing you. Well, if you think that you're ever going to make a world where we are not the only ones, our monopoly on power is who we are. And if you think that you're going to replace white supremacy with justice, you will not replace us. That's what they were saying. We see you trying to replace the system of white supremacy with the system of justice. Well, you had all those white supremacists out in Charlottesville declaring, saying it for the whole world to hear, in unmistakable terms, you will not replace us. Indeed, they are determined that no one will replace the system of white supremacy. But the thing to remember is, these guys often have bitter disagreements with one another. But first of all, they don't make it into a show for the entire world to see. And second thing that comes out of it is they know when to put that mess on hold when there's something that they're trying to achieve. You need look no further than the white feminist for that. See, this is the reason why we can't roll with a roly poly. This is the reason why we can't roll with a Angela Rye with lettuce and tomatoes on the side. Or a Joy Reid. You want to know why it is that Michael Eric Dyson did not have anything good to say when it comes to the black media? You want to know why it is that these clowns can do that? Just taking Michael Eric Dyson as a case study. You want to know why it is that he, had, he could shamelessly promote that Harriet filth? It's because Michael Eric Dyson is completely and thoroughly dependent on Comcast. Every time you look up, he's basically on MSNBC. By the way, I saw when they tried to have him sitting in for Rachel Maddow. Man, it was some of the saddest, cringe-worthy crap I ever saw in my life. He looked like a deer in headlights. He was reading his lines so robotically. I'm sitting here going, man, you could have the cameraman read those lines and probably do a better job. But Michael Eric Dyson depends on MSNBC, which means he's depending on Comcast, because Comcast owns MSNBC. He needs them in order to promote his next book. In the past, the old saying was, publish or perish. But, it, but by the mid-20th century, it basically was, be broadcast or be dead last. That's what happens with these so-called academics and so-called experts. The white media had the ability to create experts out of whole cloth. All they had to do was put you on television. And people would say, well, this person must be an expert. Otherwise, they wouldn't have put them on TV. And that's basically, that's circular logic. You haven't actually had the white media explain to you what qualifies this person. You just fill in the blanks on your own. Well, this person must be an expert. Otherwise, they wouldn't have, the white media wouldn't have had them on. That means you're putting the white media on the level of God. The white media's judgment is infallible. These guys cannot make a mistake in custom or doctrine when it comes to informing or misinforming the public. No, we got to be smarter than that. One of the things that you've heard me say repeatedly is that there are certain people and certain names that you hear me say and others that you have never heard me say and that you're not going to be hearing me say. And just to... Not putting too fine a point on it, but the thing is, I judge people by the company that they keep. There are certain areas of overlap where there can be cooperation for mutual advantage, but the thing about it is, it's going to be within certain boundaries and never outside of it. 
If there's anything that I have learned in my many decades on this earth, it happens to be to trust my instincts, because my instincts have served me well. They're well developed. A lot of black folks' hearts go pitter-pat for ta Coates, but I've looked at what ta Coates has said, especially when it comes to alternative lifestyles, and I'm going, nah, forget it. He says a couple of halfway okay things about reparations, but then he lets Barack Obama get away with saying, I ain't in favor of reparations. And then the coup de grace, which I think has finally made the veil to be lifted from some people's eyes. The scales have fallen from a few people's eyes when he went on Capitol Hill earlier this year. And he was in there with the rest of them. Basically, reparations ain't got to be a check. It's like, there you go. There you go. You now have a perfect circle of anti-black diversionary rhetoric from the white establishment, the Democrats going, well, there should be no reparations to a couple of phony baloney iconoclasts who are nothing more than light water, slightly watered down hardcore white supremacists saying, well, it should be a government program. And then the so-called reparations advocates, oh, these are the people who are really in favor of reparations. What are they saying? Well, it ain't got to be a check. So what you hear is, from the people who are the most prominent members of the white political establishment, no reparations. To those who are trying to get us to settle for anything but reparations, well, we're going to maintain that status quo no matter what. We're going to say that anything is reparations. Welfare and food stamps is reparations. The NBA is reparations. The white left sounding no different than the white right. And then the black so-called advocates for reparations echoing the exact same thing. None of them calling foul on it. None of them saying, no, reparations is one thing and one thing only. At the very least, as far as the compensation for the greatest crime in human history goes, it is not just anything you want it to be. And it cannot be something that applies to everyone. Because reparations for everyone is reparations for no one. Not even the white supremacists can argue that the black agenda is justified and that it is needed. Where the opposition begins is when it comes time to talk about how it helps black people to compete. You can propose anything where black people are concerned, just so long as it never makes us competitive. The white supremacists are hypersensitive to that. You're merely looking at what's going on right now. The, the white supremacists, as Richard Spencer pointed out, where is the trend going? They're looking 20 years down the road because what they're concerned about is not merely their position today. They are concerned about the position of their children and their grandchildren. They're thinking about what's the world going to look like after I finally take my final breath. And they want to make sure that the world is frozen the way that it is now. So when you start talking about these big movements, when you start talking about things that are going to utterly transform the landscape for our benefit, they're looking and going, this must be stopped. This is war. You're waging war on America. Well, no, we're waging war on white supremacy. White supremacy is the core of America. Well, then I guess the core of America is going to be ripped out and stomped to dust then. There's a reason why there's such psychopathic opposition to black empowerment. It's because black empowerment is transformative. Gay rights doesn't transform anything. We've had gay marriage in this country for years now. What's changed? Nothing. Illegal immigrant amnesty isn't transformative. It didn't transform anything in 1986, and it's not going to fundamentally change anything today. Black empowerment does. Because black empowerment strikes at the very foundation of American society. This society is not based on anti-Latino bigotry. It's not based on anti-gay prejudice. It is not based on anti-female sexism. This country is based upon one thing and one thing only. Anti-black racism. You read the Constitution of the United States, there's only one racial group mentioned. And it's not even the racial group who wrote the Constitution. The racial group are black people. And why does the Constitution mention black people? To enshrine in law, henceforth and forevermore, or so they thought, that black people are only three-fifths human beings. That wasn't even a political statement. That was just a hardcore racial statement. David Duke couldn't have said it any better. I happen to be a student of history. And that being the case... When it comes time to talk about the white media, I look at the history of what the white media has done. I am very leery of the idea 
of trying to court the white media for any reason. And that's because I understand the history of the white media. We build up the black media, and what's going to happen is you're going to find that a whole lot of things are going to start changing arbitrarily. You're not going to be in a situation where you're tearing your hair out about what the white media has done this week because you'll have an answer for it, one of your own. Good example to take up is Fox News. You know, one, one of the sock puppets for the right hand of white supremacy's media. What happened with Fox News is they were able to change the 2000 presidential election arbitrarily. The rest of the white media, the so-called left media, they were saying that Al Gore had won, but Fox News said we're calling Florida for W. Bush. And that sent things into a tailspin. The problem that they had that these other outlets had was the reach of Fox News. Fox News then as now reached a hell of a lot of people. And when Fox News said we're calling it for W, it created a big problem. The problem happens to be, well, nobody actually knew that. And sure, you could say, well, there's only Fox News over there saying it, but the problem that they happened to have was Fox News reached a lot of people. And unless you were going to be bringing definitive proof that W didn't win, well, it's just one of those paradoxical truths, or rather lies, of politics that basically Fox News didn't have to prove that W won. It's just a matter of you don't really have proof that he didn't. And now they've thrown this pipe bomb into the proceedings. But the only reason they were able to get away with it was because Fox News had built up their audience. Fox News had built their strength. No, they were not in a position where they could take down their rivals, but they were now in a position where when they spoke, everybody else had to come to terms with it. We saw a similar event happen earlier this year when Kamala Harris called herself announcing her lunk-headed pre presidential campaign. You had the new voices of black media speaking in unison, saying absolutely not. Kamala Harris found her would-be black support wasn't even there at launch. We crippled her as a collective. We crippled her right out of the gate, and she hasn't recovered since. She's now been reduced to hacking and slashing her campaign staff. She's going to make her last stand in Iowa. And that's probably going to be the end of her. She'll probably go on a little bit longer before she throws in the towel. But at this point here, it's just her pride not allowing her to admit to what we can all see. You're done. And she doesn't want to have to admit to it because she knows who did her in. It was a beautiful thing to be done. It was a necessary thing. And the white media took note of that. Now, what they tried to do was they tried to define who it was and how it happened. And they came up with the lie that, well, it, it probably are Russian bots. I'm saying, hey, ain't that, ain't that something? The new voices of black media hit Kamala Harris so hard, they thought the Russians did it. These people's heads are still spinning. And that's just one example. The white media is very desirous to make sure that this does not become habit forming. They're trying to flood the zone with as many high profile circuses they, as they can from the reparations fraud committee, congressional committee hearing to these revolting summits to CNN's little horse and pony show that they're putting on in a few weeks. If it hasn't started already, I don't don't, don't know because I don't care. Yes, the white media is doing everything that they can to try to use their media to say, oh, uh, we know you've been here with this black empowerment stuff. And well, we're going to have our guys say some of those words and then try to redefine it. And we're going to see if they can get away with it. The goal of the black media is not supposed to be arm wrestling with the white media over whatever lies that they put out this week. It is about building our own strength. Even Sun Tzu talked about that in The Art of War. You can deplete all your energy trying to make or coerce or otherwise influence your enemy to do what it is you want. You build up your own strength and start throwing that weight around. Your enemy has to come to terms with that no matter what he may think of it. This is where black empowerment comes into play. Now, as black folks, we've picked up some pretty bad habits. 
the greatest famine that afflicts black people, not just here in the U.S., but also around the world. It is not a famine of food that is our greatest affliction. It's ego starvation. That's the greatest famine that most black folks are concerned about. Even in a life and death struggle, there are some black folks who are trying to jockey for attention and it's all about them and sublimating the ego happens to be something that they don't wish to do. And they've always got a ready excuse for why it shouldn't have to happen. I understand that when I see it from the black bootlicks who have been career suck-ups to the white media. These people went all in for white supremacy a long time ago. They depend on the white powers that be for every crumb of their daily bread. I posted on my Twitter page how you have Deborah Martin Chase, the woman who produced that Harriet movie, and she takes responsibility for being the one who hired Cynthia Erivo to star in it. Well, she's supposed to be going to the University of Texas in Austin on the 25th, where they're going to be having a Harriet screening. And the question is, are there going to be any of the foot soldiers for black empowerment who are going to be there to ask the tough questions? That's something that does need to be discussed. Nobody is saying to get rowdy. Nobody's saying to cause any sort of disturbance. But the point is the same way that you had Jamie and Fowler who has been basically out there almost pretty much as a one-man refutation squad against the white supremacists who are calling themselves running for president, holding them accountable, holding their feet to the fire. There's a lot of folks who are absolutely outraged about the Harriet movie. Well, you got an opportunity to talk to the woman who's sticking her chest out and beating her chest like Tarzan about how great she was for bringing this movie to pass and how she's the one who cast Cynthia Erivo and how there was nothing wrong with it. And it will continue to go on as long as we make it where it's a victimless crime to be able to spout that nonsense. But regardless, black empowerment is at a crossroads right now. We're at a crossroads where we either choose ego or the agenda. We're at a crossroads where you either follow a man or you are following the message. We can point out the roly polies and the Michael Eric whatevers. And the Angela rise with lettuce and tomatoes on the side. But do not ever go thinking you're going to redeem them or rehabilitate them. And don't let them call themselves ever trying to glom on to this agenda and this message. They have been the strident, declared enemies of black empowerment. And what they thought was the white media was going to be able to, as it always does, pick and choose winners and losers and and just arbitrarily make them the winners again. Well, white media is looking and going, hmm, we're not sure how much we want to devote to this because it hasn't been effective. See, that's what happens when you get dependent on the white media in any capacity. You keep running back to them going, I need a little bit more ink. I need a little bit more attention. And they're like, nah, we think you've had enough. That's what the, that's what many of these black bootlicks are finding out. Roly Poly got kicked off of CNN. He can't even get them to return his phone calls. That's the price of willful ignorance. But black empowerment is going to keep marching forward regardless. All of this other nonsense is going to be regarded as exactly what it is, background noise. I know that in order to win the war against white supremacy, the most important strides that I can make are not against the white supremacist forces. It's not against the white media. It happens to be with you. The more black people who are on code and the more disciplined our ranks are, that's where victory is. I'm not interested in whether or not I can get into a shouting match with the white media. I'm not interested in whether or not I can force some recalcitrant, lawless, immoral white supremacist mouthpiece like a Kamala Harris or an Elizabeth Warren to go ahead and commit to reparations. I know that they're not going to. What I'm concerned about is whether or not we get enough black folks on code where we can actually start inflicting a penalty for people who fight against our interests and who work against what is it to our advantage. That's what I'm concerned about. I have said for the longest time that the war against white supremacy is not going to be won online. Sure, online has its place. 
but the war against white supremacy isn't going to be won online. It's going to be won offline. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the strides, the real strides are going to be made. Everything online must be geared toward the action to take place offline. These things are coming together. There is a lot more that needs to be done, a hell of a lot more that needs to be done. We cannot have anybody trying to tell us that we need to dial it back or that we need to change the message. We're in an all hands on deck situation. Everybody who is actually on code and with this message, who knows where it's at and what it's got to be, you need to be out there pulling this wagon hard as hell. Because we have enemies with a 500 year long head start. And they have used the massive wealth that they stole from us in order to infiltrate and pollute our community with a whole bunch of suck-ups, losers, and professional white supremacist butt-kissers. Everybody needs to be putting their shoulder to the wheel. Everyone needs to be pushing as hard as possible because that's the only way this is going to work. A few people won't do it. And many people who are half-hearted or not really, who are kind of, sort of committed to it, won't do it. This is an all-or-nothing proposition. Do not lose your focus. Do not lose your force. You stay on your square. Anything that is not talking about how to promote this agenda, and how to make sure that this agenda prevails and dominates, as far as I'm concerned, it's white noise. That's the reason why you got the breakfast schlubs and roly-poly and Joy Reid. She got furious. She just lost her mind when people started saying, wait a minute, Joy Reid, you're not even one of us. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I am. Oh, what, 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 what's this about? Because she understands that that's the value that she has for white supremacy. That's what the media has her there for. They're looking at her and going, you're not like those other slave Negroes. And she's like, sure, you're dang right. I sure am not. And then when the slaves said, hey, you ain't like us at all. You're not one of us. She goes, oh, uh, you sure I am? Because she understands that that's an existential threat to her. Joy Reid's entire audience is comprised of black people who are not immigrants. It's comprised of black people whose ancestry goes back to the plantations of this country. And Joy Reid's entire, her entire con, her entire hustle has been to try to fool us into thinking that somehow she has the same ancestry as us. As if she shed the same blood and the same mud, and she did not. So that's a threat to her, and the same thing goes for roly-poly, and the same thing goes for the breakfast schlubs. All these clowns who figure that the white media is going to give them some money and give them some prominence, and they're going to elbow their way into what happens to be the black media's domain. No chance. Keep dreaming. Won't happen. We're going to keep beating this drum. And even if we bust a hole in it, we're going to keep banging the side of the drum. We are not going to stop. We're going to keep this going because we understand what the stakes are. We also understand what the consequences are if we do not. The seeds of confusion. There's all sorts of forces working from without and within trying to sow seeds of confusion, trying to sow seeds of dissension. You got all sorts of Negroes who have spent 50 years being off code and calling themselves, having the nerve to say that we, these, these angry black media types, they ain't legitimate at all. Well, what makes you legitimate? I was at the NAACP's winter luncheon and then the Urban League spring luncheon and then the National Action Network summer luncheon. And this fall, I intend to be at the Democratic National Committee's fall luncheon. I'm, these Negroes who eat all the time and they've been eating our future. It's time out for all of it. So I call upon all of you within the sound of my voice to double and redouble your focus. Don't let anyone get you off course. Don't let anyone try to find a way to get you focusing on any sort of other side thing. This is a war against white supremacy. And nothing else. Victory is not going to be achieved merely by what we do online. And victory is certainly not going to be achieved by how much the white media takes notice. What is going to decide the difference between victory and defeat in this war is going to be how many black people do we have the critical mass that we need. We don't need all the black folks. In fact, we don't even want all the black people on board. But do we have a critical mass? 
potentially we do, but we got to discipline our ranks. And that means getting focused and staying focused.